This is the cutting edge of surgery. At the Royal London Hospital, a patient is having a lesion removed from his throat. The scalpel and other instruments are connected not to a human surgeon, but to three robot arms that reach into his mouth. The surgeon controlling them sits at a console in the corner of the theatre, although it could be on another continent. The robot has far greater precision and dexterity than a human could achieve alone. Watching an operation like this, it's already clear technology is hugely important to the way the NHS functions today. But some believe we're on the cusp of a revolution that's going to transform the way we give and receive healthcare. In the decades to come, these robots may seem clumsy and blunt in comparison with what is to follow. That's according to pioneering surgeon and former health minister Lord Darcy, who's just completed a report looking at the future of the NHS. Robotic instruments that you can swallow, do the operation inside the gut without any instrumentation, guiding them with different navigation systems, uh, robotic systems that actual fact could be even nanorobots that you can inject to a blood vessel that could float into the area where you want to treat and that tiny little nanorobot could deliver a drug for example in destroying a tumor robotics is one of half a dozen potentially transformative technologies each feeding off and feeding each other the shrinking size of monitors and power sources that will bring us tiny surgical robots will also bring us increasingly sophisticated wearable and implanted devices that will keep a constant eye on our health. Lynn Ward suffered a stroke a few days ago. Now she's part of a project to see whether wearable devices can monitor her recovery. It's hoped the sensors that researcher Sigourney Wable is fitting will one day be able to spot changes in a patient's condition far earlier than any doctor. Seeing whether from that data that we collect from the patients, whether we can find patterns in the movement that might indicate uh, whether the patient has, uh, is deteriorating. So we look at both levels of consciousness and also uh, motor function which currently are assessed just by a nurse or a doctor going to the patient and doing physical examinations. This kind of research may one day lead to smart devices that monitor every aspect of our health, alerting us to problems before they get serious. At Whiston Hospital in Merseyside, it's the nurses who've been prescribed tablets. Instead of writing information on a chart at the foot of a patient's bed, nurse Debbie Warburton enters it into an iPad. It means any of Rosemary's doctors can see how she's getting on. Believe it or not, even this basic level of digitization is unusual in NHS hospitals. Yes, our lady in bed for... Well, According to consultant Rowan Pritchard-Jones, a better, more efficient healthcare future is possible if we're prepared to harness and share the data we will increasingly generate. If we give access to our information to all the clinicians and healthcare professionals around us, they can do a lot more with it. So I hope the culture will come that not just do you go to your GP practice and they note down your blood pressure readings, but actually, why aren't we sharing this sort of information about our health using wearable devices that are streaming all the time into our healthcare record? Because if we do that, the more data points we gather, the more likely we are to have artificial intelligence systems that can start to monitor, interpret and advise on even really small changes in our health. The more we can keep people well, the cheaper healthcare becomes. So in the future, with the help of big data and sensors, we might not get ill as often. But what will happen when things do go wrong? This is where regenerative medicine comes in, regrowing the parts of our bodies that fail, one day even creating whole new replacement organs. What time point do we have here? Professor Anna Williams says in a few decades' time, this will change and save lives. Already we as a research community are storing cord blood when babies are born so that there are 
um, our blood cells there that might be helpful for, for people who have had leukemia, for example, to replace that. So we can store that. The question is, can we store other cells? You know, perhaps even say, well, you know, when you're born, you, um, we you know, take samples of what your cells are, store them somewhere, and then perhaps change them to make them be able to repair the bits of you that go wrong over time. Now that sounds like science fiction, but in 50 years we might be able to do that. The future will include tailored repairs and other personalised treatments, drugs that are specifically created to suit our individual medical needs and genetic makeup. Personalised medicine is where everything is moving from one size fits all, which is what we had before, in terms of one tablet for whatever that condition happens to be. In the future, we will know who are the responders to our treatment. So we personalise the medicine based on the individual responses, which we could predict based on data, looking at their genome or looking at the tumour gen genome, for example, and tailor the treatment. But perhaps the most profound revolution is going to come from artificial intelligence, a technology that feeds into all the other technologies we've mentioned, and it's what makes some of them possible. Increasingly powerful supercomputers will be able to crunch huge amounts of data, keep up with new medical developments and learn from them. At the Royal College of Physicians, they celebrate the human brains that have advanced medical knowledge over the past five centuries. Last week, however, this prestigious venue was showcasing a computer brain. Hello Louise, how can I help you? In a presentation, the health tech company Babylon announced how their computer had done when presented with the Royal College of GPs diagnostics exam. So how did we do? At first attempt, Babylon's AI achieved 81%. In other words, they said that their AI was now more proficient than the average human GP at taking the test. And have you noticed any hearing loss? Yeah, I have actually. The AI considers every possible option, settling on the most likely answer. It is most likely to be Meniere's disease. Not everyone, though, is convinced. The Royal College of GPs has questioned the finding. However, in the future, might computers, not humans, look after us? Might the brain behind the surgical robot also be a machine? No, no, Never. no. There is no way that I think we will ever get robots taking over all of those thought processes that come into how you actually physically do the surgery. I'm sure we will have more and more surgical procedures that can be done with a robot assisting the surgeon, but I really don't think we'll ever be at a point where we've made ourselves redundant. People come from all over the world to see doctors in London's Harley Street. But in the future, we may not need to go to centres of excellence like hospitals to see our human doctors. More and more providers are giving consultations from a distance via smartphone apps. And that is a trend that is only going to increase. It seems maddening that we ask frail patients to make four-hour round trips when actually technology can keep them at home. That's exactly where care should be going. We should be keeping our hospitals for those patients that most critically need that mass of people to swarm around them in that moment. <laughs> Back in Whiston Hospital, one of the NHS's newest users, Sonny, is understandably pretty relaxed about his healthcare and the technologies that may shape it in the future. But by the time he's as old as the NHS is now, it may have changed beyond recognition. 